language. They typically use it when they're angry and saying ill things to one another. And the interesting thing is, though, if you look around different cultures, you find that hell is very common. You will find hell in a range of different cultures around the world, and particularly, and strangely, a lot of those who have volcanic activity of some shape or form near them. Places where they see open lava and they see lots of burning and smoke and sulfurous fumes, a lot of those cultures have a very strong understanding or thought inclination towards hell. They, they tend to believe in hell because they see burning things from below the earth's surface. Islam, we know, has a strong belief in hell, and uh, that's an Islamic uh, portrait or an Islamic uh, piece of art. Um, the Jain religion believes in seven levels of hell, which is very interesting for a couple of reasons. And um, people, as you see in this, this imagery of Jain art, are punished in several different ways in hell, either being bitten by dogs or impaled on sp spikes. You know, really awful things. Even in African tradition from East Africa, you see... Here is, uh, uh, this is from, from East Africa, from uh, Selassie uh, territory. You see a whole lot of people getting thrown into the heart of this terrible abyss where there's fire and there's a, a nasty creature doing terrible things to them. You even go as far out as Burma and you see similar thoughts that when people die according to their traditions, if they've done wrong, they get put into a burning cauldron and soaked with oil and other terrible things. So you can see a similar type of thinking persists around the world. And the Western view, which most of us have, either directly by our ancestors or by some of the missionaries who came to South Africa and brought these thoughts to South Africa, the Western view is traditionally based on mostly Greek and Roman and probably a little bit of Zoroastrian origins. So the Greeks and the Romans really did believe very strongly in the underworld, in a place of the dead where you would be taken across a great river, the river sticks into the netherworld, and people would pay the boatman to take them in this terrible journey to the, to the other side of the river. In fact, that's where one of the old traditions of putting coins on the eyes of the dead was, so that they would have the money to pay the boatman to take them to the other side of the river, the land of the dead. And the Zoroastrian religion is a very interesting one. It's a very ancient religion that still exists to this day from Persia, modern-day Iran. And a lot of the thoughts that people have came from the Zoroastrian religion, even Greek, it influenced Greek and other thinking, But the Zoroastrians used to believe in everything having a balance. So if there was a good God, there was an evil God. If there was a lovely place, there was a terrible place. If there was a place of peace, there was a place of fire and torment. And the Zoroastrian religion was very strongly based around an eternal flame which was kept burning in their, their religious worship. And even to this day, um, the Zoroastrian religion is based around fire. So all of these understandings of people going to the netherworld have their origins in our deep and distant past. And where a lot of Western thought has been anchored um, started in, in some way, and of course it, it preceded this, but became indoctrinated in the way that people thought in a very interesting piece of work by um, a, an Italian poet, Dante um, Alighieri. So Dante was born in Florence, and he wrote probably, as many have described it, the most in incredible piece of Italian literature that, that has ever existed. And in Dante's Divine Comedy, um, he and the, um, the, the poet Virgil, Dante and Virgil, discuss how people go down into hell and the different levels of hell which they experience for doing evil. In fact, there was a map that was created this, which included the seven circles of hell. Um, here's one representation, here's another. And just to give you a, a little bit of a tour of, of hell in, in terms of Dante's uh, work, um, you would have people at the top at the lightest part of hell who were just futile 
Um, if you were gluttonous, you started moving down here. If you were a really bad criminal, you moved into the sixth circle of hell. If you were warmongers and psychopaths, you moved down even further, traitors at the bottom, and ultimately Lucifer sitting at the worst bottom part of hell. But there was also a wormhole where if you were engaged in any of the, the, seven, the seven cardinal sins, which we'll come to in a moment, you could have a short circuit path to get there. It's like a, a terrible game of snakes and ladders. Um, so this influenced a lot of Western thought. And this thinking, even though it was, you know, obviously of a literature and literary nature, has pervaded the thinking of the Catholic Church and, and many others, and has in many ways codified some of the horrors that people talk about or think about in terms of hell. It led to a very interesting phenomenon in the Middle Ages. In, in the Middle Ages, a lot of people were then concerned about falling into the trap of hell. So the churches used to put on what were known as morality plays, and they would have these great touring troops of, of troubadours and, uh, and, uh, and actors who would go from town to town to try and teach people very graphically, because most people couldn't read, what the terrors of hell would be like. And they would have people falling into hell and others uh, you know, being saved and the, the entire path of human life taught in these morality plays. And you find that it influences medieval art where these thoughts of people getting burnt in different forms of hell and, and punishment are presented. Here's an example of hell with a huge open mouth swallowing everybody who was thrown out from God, just going down to this terrible place where Satan himself is swallowing up all of the people and the, the devils are there and the demons to, to help torment all these departed souls. And you can imagine if you were a person in rural England or rural Europe and these plays came to town, they could have a really serious effect on you and you'd be petrified of ending up in a terrible thing like place like that. So it had a profound effect on the psychology and the way that people thought. And of course that pervaded, you know, the Western way of religion and many of the preachers who came to South Africa brought similar messages with them. But it's very interesting that the word hell that we have is actually a proper name. It's, you know, like my name's David. The word hell is actually the name of a person in tradition. And that's the uh, apparently a very nasty lady whose name is hell. And um, she was a, a Norse goddess by the name of hell, ruling over this, this terrible part of the world which was also called hell. So she was hell ruling over hell. And that word hell, and you get it in, in for example, the, the alternative rendering of Switzerland. Switzerland's called Helvetica. And the word hell is in the front of the name of Switzerland as an example. Because it was a Germanic word, halia, which means something that covered up. So when people went to hell, they went to this terrible, nasty woman who was apparently half living and half dead, half rotting while she was alive. And she would then be able to take people into the underworld and they would be covered up. So, you know, the words that people often say, you know, it's, it's a horrible phrase that people use, go to hell, used to mean, why don't you go die? And literally it's taken a different sense in modern English, but go to hell used to mean go die. I don't want to see you anymore. So hell as a word is actually from this, this old Norwegian Norse goddess and has permeated our, our English and, and the modern world as well. Modern views on, on hell, though, are often quite different, aren't they? I mean, here was a, a Times, uh, sorry, an Economist cover from uh, December 2012, and um, here's the detail of it. What the, uh, the, the cartoonist there was, was trying to show is that don't worry about the hell beneath the earth. Look at the hell that human beings are creating on the earth. And he was at pains to show gluttony and sloth and pride and envy and greed and lust and all the other sins which are apparently the things that lead to hell. And those are the things which he showed in this cartoon 
are present in, in today's world. So a lot of people today will either really believe in, in a terribly frightening place called hell, or they'll dismiss it as a joke with uh, a cartoon such, such as this and say, you just need to go to Syria today to experience real hell. So what we need to do now is just consider some religious viewpoints. So Does this eternal abyss of death, damnation, and evil really exist? Hell is home to our most primal fears. It's full of torture, torment, pain for all eternity. Is hell more than a myth? There is hell fire. There is fire in hell. There is a literal fire in hell that is burning right now. Some, not only is hell real, it can be found here on Earth. An erupting volcano in Iceland, pitch black caverns twisting beneath the jungle, a lake of fire in an African desert. These remote places share one thing in common. They are all believed to be ancient entrances to hell. For thousands of years and across countless cultures, people have believed that hell lies just below our feet. Hell was considered to be a physical place, a place that was under the earth and that you could actually visit and see with your own eyes. Across the globe, six hell mouths connect the world of the living with the world of the dead. I do believe there is a literal place of hell. I believe there must be a place for punishment. In these remote sites, explorers are unearthing passages once thought to literally be the gateways to another world. In the history of religions, one finds evidence of caves or volcanic openings that people thought were entrances into the netherworld. These gates of hell are typically located in very harsh places, in deserts, exploding volcanoes, in islands, caves. These are the kind of geographical spots where you're likely to find a portal to hell. What these explorers are finding is shocking. Getting through a cave like this is very dangerous. Some of the people that come here, they never left. It was like an abyss, a bottomless pit. It was the most hopeless, terrifying feeling that you can even imagine. Linking each site and every legend are eerily similar visions of the underworld, leading to one question that has persisted throughout history. What awaits us when we pass through the gates of hell? Pretty terrifying, isn't it? And you, you can see how you know a lot of ideas from different cultures have all blended into one. That people from different culture, cultures have all thought the same thing. Now, here's an, another video clip. This video clip was taken with the audio that apparently came from a place in Siberia where they were doing deep drilling eight kilometers down, and they lo apparently lowered a microphone down into the, the the hole, and they recorded the following sounds. And they, they said that these are actually terrifying sounds, but they are the sounds of the dead screaming in hell. Unbelievable. And then um, here's an example of another preacher. And, and, you know, you may have been exposed to something like this at a church you went to at some stage. It is still a place that you must deal with one day. Somebody, my friend, died this morning and they went to hell. Somebody took their last breath this day. 
July the 20th, 2008, they drew their last breath and awakened in hell. What a shock it must have been. There are those that deny that it exists, but that doesn't change it. One day you'll lift up your eyes in hell. It's descriptive talk in Luke chapter 16 when the rich man died and was buried. And the Bible says in hell he lifted up his eyes. It's, a, it's almost as if it says he awakened in a place that was absolutely beyond his wildest imagination. He never for one time thought that such a place like that could exist. He lifted up his eyes in hell. He became aware of his presence. He knew where he was. And from that moment on, there's not a thing he could do to change his circumstance and his situation. There is no salvation in hell. There's no Savior in hell. There's no Bible in hell. There's no blood in hell. There's no altars in hell. There's no forgiveness in hell. Whatever goes to hell stays in hell. It's permanent. It's settled. It's settled. It's over with. What you've done in this life is what determines where you go. When you die without God, you go to hell. So, you know, when a person looks at that, you, you can understand how people are terrified. You know, if you don't know your Bible, you'll look at a lot of those things and you'll say, just to be safe, I better go along with them. And I think... My dear friends, you really are doing yourself a big disservice if you do that because you need to open your Bibles and challenge these things for yourself. So what, what I'd like to do now is just pick up some of the summary views on hell. And these it's not exhaustive, but if you had to look around and ask people who believe in hell what they think it's about, they would say, well, it's a place below the earth. They'd say it's very real. It's a place for eternal punishment place where there's only evil, you know, plainly it's a terrible place. It's a place where there's physical pain because people can scream and cry and suffer and feel all these things. It's a fiery place, obviously. It's a place where only sinners go. It's a place of thick darkness, despite the fire. It's got limitless capacity, and it's a place for the devil and demon tormentors to make life miserable forever for the people who are consigned to hell. So those may be some of the ideas, and you, you may have heard some of them, probably. So I'd like us just to have a look at these issues. Maybe just pick one or two of them and go through them. So I'm going to go through five and just have a look and see whether they make sense with the Bibles open on your laps. Because what we're interested in here is what the Word of God says. We don't want people shouting and screaming and making us afraid without us reading God's Word. I want the comfort of God's Word in my life, and I'm sure you do too. So maybe what we need to do is look at this in terms of what the Bible says. So the first issue I have is that of the devil in hell. So if we had to ask the question, hell is a place of the devil and demons. It's completely godless, right? And some people would say, well, yep. That is the case. It's a godless, terrible, frightening place. Well, what we need to firstly understand is that there was somebody who wrote about this, a really good authority. It was a man called King David. And Acts chapter 13 tells us something about King David. If you don't know much about him, take what is said in Acts 13 about King David to heart. God raised up for them David as king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Isn't that interesting? So here's a man who God raised up, who can speak on behalf of God because he was attuned to God. He was at one with God. All right? So what did David say about hell? David said something very interesting. And it's Psalm 139, verses 7 to 8. And you can look it, up, look it up in your own time. And you'll notice from verse 1, this is speaking about God. Verse 1 talks of God. Verses 7 to 8. Where can I go from your spirit, God? Says David. Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Did you get that? This is speaking about God. David said if he made his bed in hell, 
You, God, are there. Where's there? It's hell. We either have to believe what David says or we don't. That's a very interesting scripture. So, so note that one down, that God is truly everywhere, including hell. That's the only conclusion we can come to. There's no other conclusion we can draw from that. Scripture says God is also present in hell. So the next point I'd like to pick up is the issue with sinners. Remember we said at the beginning that, well, you know, this is a place where really nasty people go and sinners go. So the first question is, hell is for sinners only, right? You know, because people say that you know, other people go to heaven or, or something else. So hell is only for sinners. Well, we've got to ask ourselves the question, was Jesus a sinner? Now, I think all of us here would answer that automatically, that we would know that this is the key characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter tells us plainly, in 1 Peter 2, verses 21 to 22, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps to be like him, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So Peter is quite plain that Jesus did no sin. So I think we all agreed with that. But then, my dear friends, please would you just note down the next verse, because the next verse is the one that would cause you a lot of problems if you had that idea that hell was for sinners only. Because I have to tell you a sad thing, if you believe in hell according to those preachers, Jesus went to hell. Did you know that? In Acts chapter, 20, Acts chapter 2, verses 31, verse 31. And of course, what we're getting here is a quotation from Psalm 16. So it's a quote from Psalm 16, and you can put the two next to each other, and you can compare them. And it's a great thing to always compare Scripture with Scripture. In Acts chapter 2, he, again, King David, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Now, you can only be left in hell, or not left in hell, if you were there. If Jesus hadn't gone to hell, he couldn't have been resurrected out of hell. You see, that's the plain and simple reading of these verses. If you disagree with me, please let's talk about it afterwards. But that's what the verses say. And that's what the importance of Psalm 16 is. That hell itself couldn't hold Jesus. He had to come out because God raised him and resurrected him from his hell. And yet, the sad truth is, my dear friends, hell is to be a one-way trip for the wicked. So people who don't know God are not vaguely interested in him. Hell can be a true one-way trip for them. Have a look at Job 21, verses 30 to 32. Job is speaking, and Job says the following things. The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. Yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. And that word grave there is the Hebrew word for hell in the Bible. These are people who are wicked. God says through Job that they're going to go to the grave and they're going to remain there. They're going to go to hell and stay in hell. There'll be no path out for them. So our conclusion, the second conclusion is, hell is not only for sinners, and going to hell is not always a one-way journey. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So the third point then that we need to look at is the, the question of knowledge. And by that I mean, in hell sinners will know that they've made terrible choices and regret them forevermore, right? In other words, if you want to really punish somebody, you've got to keep them awake and alive in some form that they can be punished and said, you did wrong, you did wrong, you did wrong, and they can suffer torment forever and ever. They've got to know they made the wrong choices and suffer forever and ever and ever. 
Not so, according to the traditional view of hell. But again, we need to consider the origins of these things. So I said I was going to come to this, this concept of the seven deadly sins. And if any of you have been in, in a Catholic environment or Catholic school or anything of that nature, you would have heard of the seven deadly sins or also the seven cardinal or seven capital sins. They might have been told to you in those different ways. And you can, you can pick this up on the internet or in books and everywhere else. But these seven sins actually are the ones that, remember at the bottom of Dante, that was the short circuit to get to, to the lowest part of hell, to be able to be pushed into hell if you did these things. And the first one is the, the sin of pride. And on the right of it is what the punishment was, to be broken on the wheel. And I'm going to pick up just three out of these seven for a very good reason. The second one was envy. And that, if you were envious, you were put in freezing water forever. So in hell, which is very hot apparently, there's this place of absolute icy water that you're going to get put in forever if you're envious. The next sin was the sin of anger or hatred. And that is the punishment of being dismembered alive. That you would be feeling being cut open all the time and you would never stop being cut open all day, all night, forever. Cut, cut, cut. Absolutely awful. I mean, horrendous thoughts. That was for the sin of anger and hatred. Sloth, meaning you're lazy, you got thrown into snake pits. That would certainly keep you moving. Um, greed. If you were greedy, you were put in cauldrons of boiling oil. Gluttony, you were forced to eat rats, toads and snakes. And that was not for the French only. And then lust. If you were lustful, it was to be smothered in fire and brimstone forever. To be covered in fire and torment. And it was a really horrible suffering. So I picked up those three on the side there for a very, very good reason. Just remember what they are. Envy, anger and lust. Because there was a very wise man, and it was the son of King David. It was, it was King Solomon. And King Solomon had the following things to say. What did King Solomon have to say about these types of things? He said in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 3 to 6. Ecclesiastes 9, 3 to 6. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. And when he says under the sun, he means in normal living, ordinary day-to-day -day life. That one thing happens to all. Oh, that's interesting. Now, one thing happens to all people. Truly the hearts of the Son of Man are full of evil. Man is in, their, is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Isn't that interesting? You would have thought that Solomon, with all his wisdom that was God-given, would have said, well, after all their madness and craziness and evil, they would have gone to this place of torment like the, the Catholics would, would tell people they would. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Just think of the implications of that. This is talking about one thing happening to everybody, to the people who were full of evil and madness, but when they die, they didn't know about their punishment. They weren't tormented because they knew nothing. That's what the Bible says. So we either have to start listening to what God says in the Bible, or we start believing the fables of what people tell us. And of course Solomon continues that they've got no reward for the memory of them is forgotten. And that's the sad truth. I mean, how many of us know details about our great-grandparents or even further back? Even the ones we love, their memory is forgotten, and we hardly know anything about them, not even their names in many cases. Their love, their hatred, and their envy have perished. Isn't that interesting? There were those three that I picked out from the cardinal sins on the previous page, those seven deadly sins. Their love or lust, their hatred, and their envy, if they were doing evil, are perished. So in other words, for all those sins, they go to nothing. They perish. They don't sit and suffer it for eternity and realizing the error of their ways. They perish. Now, all of us have got something that's perished. It's like a, a rubber 
tube or you try and use something that was you kept in the cupboard for a couple of years and you try and use it and it's perished. It's not working. It means it doesn't work anymore. It's finished. And that's the description that Solomon gives to all those who do evil. They just go away. So the conclusion we can draw for number three is that there's no consciousness in hell. The people who are in hell just know nothing. That's what scripture said. What about the issue of torment? What about the issue of punishment? Because as you heard one of those preachers say, there has to be a hell because there's got to be a place of punishment. Evil people have got to be punished. There's, there's just got to be something horrible for them. And they might say that in hell sinners are tormented and cry out eternally, right? In other words, as that one video and audio clip tried to show that people are screaming there forever. They're shouting, shouting, I wish I could get out. That other preacher was saying that, you know, the, the, the rich man was screaming in hell, wished he could get out of hell. You know, is this really what God is teaching in the Bible? Again, it's not what the psalmist says. Have a look at this psalm, Psalm 115, verses 16 to 18. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. Isn't that interesting? It said that any who die just go to silence. You would think that the psalmist would have gone and said, listen, you know, those who are waiting for Christ might be silent, but those who are being punished were screaming. The psalmist says they die and they go quiet. That's why we have the modern English phrase. It's as silent as the grave. We know these things to be true. People just believe in fallacies. They believe in all these crazy things that have been made up and worried about for many years. So the fourth conclusion then is hell is a very quiet place, a really deathly quiet place. And then finally, number five, the, the issue of preservation. Because the issue is, in hell, evildoers would have to be preserved for punishment for eternity, not so. Because imagine if you were taken to hell and punished on day one, and then you died or you couldn't be punished anymore. It would mean you'd have to be kept going for day two and day three and day infinity forever. If this is eternal punishment, you'd have to be kept going in some form to be punished the next day and the next day and the next day. Is this what scripture says? Again, the psalmist gives us a lovely answer. Psalm 145, verse 20. The Lord preserves all who love him. Isn't that interesting? Who is preserved? The sinful or those who love God? But plainly, as the psalmist says, God will preserve and keep those who love him. But the wicked, he will destroy. They're not being preserved. And you see why it's so important is it's against the concept of preservation. The wicked are destroyed, but the good are preserved. You would think that the evil would have to be preserved for punishment. The psalmist says they're not. They're gone. And Solomon agreed again. Proverbs 21, verses 15 to 16. Destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. So if you work iniquity, sin, Scripture says you're going to be destroyed. You're not going to be preserved. You're going to be destroyed. A man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Isn't that an interesting use of the word, rest? It doesn't mean they're going to be screaming in oil or fed snakes. They are going to a place for no more. You see, scriptural teaching is quite plain. Deuteronomy actually picks up this point very nicely. And in Deuteronomy, it was talking about Pharaoh's chariot. But some people say, you know, well, how do you get everlasting destruction then? That's spoken of in scripture. Well, I must tell you that Pharaoh, the, the Pharaoh who had, uh, was, was obviously involved at the time of Moses, 
was a person who was destroyed forever and eternally. Have a look at Deuteronomy 11. God signs in his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all his land, what he did to the army of Egypt and to their horses and their chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. Now, what happened is that in approximately 1500 BC, they were destroyed in the Red Sea. Pharaoh's chariots were destroyed, and Pharaoh was destroyed. But you see, this term that God has destroyed them to this day is absolutely true, because in 1978 they found some of those chariot wheels this day, and they're still destroyed to this day. You see, what Scripture is saying is when God destroys, they're destroyed for eternity. And it's a very interesting use of the phrase. We as humans might think you've got to keep destroying every single day. What scripture says when God destroys people eternally means he does it once. And there's no hope. The Pharaoh's chariot wheels still at the bottom of the Red Sea. It's quite remarkable, isn't it? So the psalmist then concludes for us that the wicked have no future. Mark the blameless man, Psalm 37, verses 37 to 38. Observe the upright person. Look at, look at the person who's trying to do right by God. For the future of that man is peace, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. Not preserved. Not suffering for eternity. The punishment is that they get snuffed out like you would do a candle. And they are no more. No hope. That's the end of them. That's what scripture says. So conclusion number five then is hell is the place where the wicked are destroyed in death. And I think those conclusions are very powerful ones. So if we put them together as a summary, we'd say God is everywhere, including hell. Hell is not only for sinners, it is the lot of all humanity. Going to hell is not always a one-way journey, as the Lord Jesus Christ showed. There is no consciousness in hell. People don't know what life is like, or they do not have life in hell, so therefore they can't be conscious. And hell is indeed a very quiet place where the wicked are destroyed in death. So if you and I had to try and understand this maybe a little bit better, I have to do something quite disturbing. I have to show you a picture, a real picture of hell, if you're ready for it. Because that's what hell really is, my dear friends. It's exactly what scripture describes it as. It's a covered place. Because that's what the word hell means. Hell means the grave in Scripture. And you can take down these two Psalms next to each other. Psalm 16 and Psalm 49, verse 15. Psalm 16, verse 10. Psalm 49, verse 15. And what's so interesting is that the same concept is presented in two places. Once it's translated hell. Once it's translated grave. Why? Because the translators once chose to make it hell and once they decided to make it grave. But it's the same Hebrew word. You will not leave my soul in hell. You will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. The two are equivalent. So those words are the same. In the Hebrew, it's the word Sheol. In the Greek, it's the word Hades. Very simple. Any of you can just look it up on, your, on Google or on a Bible concordance, and you'll see that's the case. In other words, hell and the grave are the same thing. So if that is the case, so just let, let's have, go with it for a moment and see whether this makes sense. Let's take this concept of the grave being hell and test all of those five conclusions against that. So instead of using the word hell, I'm going to just swap it with the word grave and see whether those five conclusions work. God is everywhere, including here. The grave is not only for sinners, it's the lot of all humanity. 
so good people die too? Going to the grave is not always a one-way journey. Absolutely, because Christ preached the resurrection from the dead. There is no consciousness in the grave, because it's absolutely quiet. An absolutely silent and docile place. The grave is where the wicked are destroyed in death. So if you buried a wicked person, that would be the last you'd ever see of them. They'd be completely destroyed. So why should you not fear hell? For two reasons. The first is that hell is quite literally, if you put your trust and your life in the hands of God, if you truly turn to him, if you are baptized into the name of Christ and follow him with all your heart, hell will be no more frightening than going to bed. Simply going to sleep, being unconscious in a dark room, pulling the covers over your head in a hidden place and going to sleep is the only fear you should have of hell. And that's a very comforting thing because we know if we are Christ's, we will be resurrected for judgment. And hell or the grave is just nothing more than a temporary sleep. That's why we say about people who die in Christ that they are simply asleep in Christ because it's exactly the phrase that the New Testament uses. Remember when Jesus was going to raise Lazarus? He had to say to them, he is Lazarus is sleeping. And they didn't understand it. You see, to Jesus it was temporary. Because Jesus has the power of death and hell. He has the keys of death and hell. He can liberate people from that condition of death and the grave. And the second reason why we shouldn't fear hell is because Christ has done it before. If we had to trust this without there being an example before, it would be a leap of faith. But God has given proof to all men in that he raised Christ from the dead. This is our confidence why we can sit here and proclaim these things today. It was the resurrection of the dead that turned people who were petrified of the Romans into solid Christians who would give up their life for their Lord. They didn't do it because they thought Jesus might have raised, been raised from the dead. It was because they met a raised Christ and he convicted them that he was alive and they were prepared to put down their life for him. That was because they met a real Christ who was raised. That confidence, my dear friends, makes us not fear hell. So those are two very comforting things. You see, versus the fear-mongering that you hear, and all that other stuff that we saw, this is the comfort that God gives to those who love and fear him. We've got to focus on doing the right things in our lives so that we can be on this side of God's judgments. But before we end off, there is a fear that Jesus says that we should have. And it's, it's a hard thing to bring up, but Jesus did say there is something we have to fear. The words of Jesus to us are very plain. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 to 29, Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. And the word soul means life. You can't, don't worry about those who kill your body, but have got no impact on your spiritual life. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, why I pick up this verse, it's very important, because Jesus is obviously saying we've got to be afraid of the circumstance, the, the second part. And the word hell there, my friends, and please check it out for yourself. I'll show you how to do it in the concordance in the library afterwards if you'd like. That word hell there is a different word from the grave that we were talking about. The word that Jesus used for hell here is the word Gienna. Or, as I've highlighted and read there, it's be afraid of the valley of Hinnom. It was a terrible place where these kings burnt their sons to other gods, to pagan gods. And it became a place of rubbish. It was a place where it became the, the, the rubbish dump for Jerusalem. God said, it was so despicable what you did. I'm going to make that place your city dump. And just give, let, let me show you 
this Gehenna. But you need to understand what it was like. But first, before I go there, I'm going to have to take you to the Philippines. Because there's a place called Smoky Mountain outside Manila in the Philippines. Now, Manila is a very densely populated city in the Philippines. They've got a pile of rubbish outside, the, outside Manila, which smokes and smokes so badly you can see it from satellite pictures. 30,000 people pick an existence out of scrap metal from this terrible dump. It's called Smoky Mountain because it burns day and night. Garbage is thrown there. Dead animals are thrown there. People die and are left there. It's a terrible, stinking, horrible place. And anybody who works there knows whatever goes into Smoky Mountain never comes out. You're, what goes in there is scrap. It's broken to its pieces and it's scrap. It's finished. It's burnt. The fires never go out. Everything that goes in there is full of maggots and worms. It's a horrible place. And this was the place, exactly the same outside Jerusalem, called Gehenna. This is the word that Jesus said. Just like Smoky Mountain, here's Jerusalem's Smoky Mountain, the Valley of Hinnom. It was the landfill. You can see it was in a valley. Just like they did, by the way, in the city of Edinburgh in Scotland, in the valley they used to throw all the rubbish. And it became a dirty, disgusting place till they drained it. This was the rubbish dump of Jerusalem. And they burnt fires there. Criminals were thrown there. Dead animals were thrown there. Jesus said, you've got to worry in case your life ends up in total destruction. We, we spoke about resurrection, and that's not total destruction. But if your life leads you on a path where you go symbolically to being totally destroyed, Jesus says that's what you must worry about. So this is how it works. And just bear with me for a moment while we walk through this process. Here are all people on the earth. And as we said, all people die and go to the grave. Not so? The grave is the common lot of all people. Hell or the grave. Everybody goes to hell. Jesus went there. If we are not alive when Jesus comes back, we go to hell. We go to the grave. But some people are resurrected and they are judged. They can go back to the grave, but they're resurrected. And for them, hell just simply seemed like a sleep in a bed. It was a temporary thing. It was not to be worried about. They were resurrected and judged and by God's grace found worthy of everlasting life. But what Jesus was saying, watch out in case your life means you go to hell and you never come out. In other words, you're not part of the resurrection. Because if you go there, you'll be like going to Gehenna. If you threw a dead dog into Gehenna, that's the end of that dog. It's a total hopeless end. You see, without resurrection, my dear friends, there is no hope for human beings. You go to hell and there's no way out. It becomes a Gehenna. And the worst is that if a person was resurrected and hadn't found his or her place in the kingdom, you can also go to Gehenna. You can be sent away from the presence of Christ to total destruction. So the real question is, between those two outcomes, what are we going to do about life? We're all going to face death. You know, it's one of the things of modern life that because we live in a clinical society, we don't see death. But every one of us will die and we have to face these issues. So Jesus is saying, are you going to worry about Gehenna? Or is it just going to be a temporary thing? Is it going to be like a sleep? Because you can choose either to work and work and work for wages that don't satisfy or receive a, a gift. What would you rather have? If I had to say to you, I've got two things. You can work for the next 20, 30 years and receive wages and they're not going to be enough, or I've got a wonderful gift underneath here. Which would you choose? You'd want to choose the gift. And this is exactly what Romans says. Romans 6 verse 23. The wages of sin is death. You work and work away at sin and the end of it is death. Finished. Conclusion. No more. The gift of God is eternal life. 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Did you see that death is implicitly eternal? But life is not always eternal. It's a gift. It's a gift of mercy by the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we don't have to fear hell, can we do what we like? Is it, does it mean we can just do whatever we want, live our lives any which way? Well, let's end then on the words of King Solomon, that wise king. And if we want to take what a summary verse of what we should be doing tonight, let's listen to what Solomon says in the last words for tonight. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 to 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear hell? No. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. If we know the principles of God's truth, if we are responsible for judgment, God will test us to see whether we are his or whether we are not. So then ultimately, my friends, you don't have to fear hell. If you make the right choices, and our real desire is simply that you make the right choice based on scriptural facts. So please talk to us about these things. It is urgent. It's not something to be deferred for another day. You know, you would, if, if you were really ill, you would worry about your health insurance or life insurance. You'd make plans. How is it with something like death and with these questions, we can defer it forever? I ask you to please consider these things genuine in your hearts and speak to us about these things so that we can talk to you about the real path that God wants us to follow. Thanks so much for listening.